everyone has that one friend, the one who stands out not for their exuberance during the holidays, but for their absence of it. Patrick was that guy for us. While everyone else decorated their houses with lights or slipped into costumes, he'd be the shadow at the back of the room, eyes narrowed, a permanent scowl etched onto his face. But it wasn't every festivity that darkened his demeanor. No, it was one particular day that he despised, Halloween. Growing up, Patrick and I were inseparable. Every 31st of October, we'd paint the town orange, our candy bags growing heavier with each house. But as Patrick got older, his fervor for the holiday began to lessen. I'd initially chalked it up to typical teenage rebellion. Maybe he felt we were outgrowing trick or treating. Maybe he wanted more mature celebrations. We were at a Halloween party. I had managed to pull him along, hoping to rekindle some of our old spirits. Instead of a costume, Patrick arrived in his everyday clothes, claiming he was dressing up as an underfunded college kid. As the night went on, he had just the right amount of drinks to loosen his tongue, but not cloud his mind. A girl, more devilish in appearance than attire, bumped into him. The brief encounter, seemingly harmless to anyone else, startled him. Unable to contain my curiosity any longer, I asked him about his evident disdain for the holiday. He looked like a deer caught in headlights, clearly unprepared for the confrontation. His glass emptied. He hesitated, shifting his weight from one foot to another. He began, you're not going to believe me. Patrick began telling me his story. His parents were out, leaving him as the appointed candy distributor for the night. They'd given him a strict curfew, 10 p.m. all lights out, doors locked, no exceptions. The evening started innocently enough, with Patrick seated on the porch, surrounded by candy, and a festive tableau of candy eager kids. But as the sun set, the jovial atmosphere began to shift. Around 8.30 p.m., the tide of children slowed, allowing Patrick a breather to move indoors. There, sat on the couch, he lost himself in a horror movie intermittently disrupted by the doorbell. The house grew quieter, with only the distant laughter of kids recounting their conquests, filling the silence. The movie played, the popcorn bowl emptied, and time ticked by. It was during a particularly suspenseful scene that a lone silhouette appeared, making its way up his driveway. He glanced at the clock, 10.08 p.m. by now. The majority of children were at home, rifling through their spoils. But Patrick recalled from previous years that the ones who knocked on doors this late were hoping for a bigger payout, aiming to take advantage of households, eager to get rid of their candy stash. Seeing no way out and not wanting to disappoint, Patrick decided to reward this last child's persistence. He would give him everything left, and then, as his parents had instructed, he'd turn off the lights and call it a night. The child rounded the corner, and as Patrick armed himself with a handful of candy and opened the door, the child had reached the foot of the stairs. He realized then that the person just outside the beams of the porch light was much taller than a child. The thick, tattered cloak the figure wore looked exceptionally high quality, not your average store-bought costume. Chains attached to the cloak created a symphony of jingles, with every movement and protruding horns ripped through the fabric of the hood. Trick or treat, give me something good to eat, said the figure. The sound was unnatural, as if two voices spoke as one causing a shiver to cascade down Patrick's spine. As the figure stepped into the glow of the porch light, the costume became even more terrifying. Beneath the hood was a mask, resembling a goat. Its eyes, a gleaming yellow with reptilian slits, seemed to bore into Patrick's soul. The mask was incredibly lifelike, with fur that seemed to sway with every breath of wind. From its nostrils, an eerie mist seemed to escape, and the eyes, those damned eyes looked as if they had been harvested from a live creature. And then, in a moment that froze Patrick's heart, the goat's eyes blinked, reacting on sheer instinct. Patrick slammed the door shut, locking it immediately. But outside, the cloaked figure began its assault on the door, the thudding echoing through the hallway. From the peephole, Patrick watched in horror as the figure's forked tongue slid out, caressing its lips with a ravenous hunger. Hooved feet, which now clicked ominously, confirmed Patrick's worst fears. This wasn't just a costume. The forceful ramming against the door made Patrick press back against it, holding his ground. In a desperate move, he turned off the porch lights, praying the figure might be fooled into thinking he wasn't home. For a moment, the relentless assault ceased, but the sound of chains jangling and hoofs clicking moved in the direction of the living room window. 
In pure terror, Patrick dashed to the living room, drawing the curtains. He noticed that every other house on the street had already turned off their lights. Fumbling in the darkness, Patrick switched off every light he could find on the ground floor and hid behind the couch, listening intently. To his relief, the sinister sounds eventually faded. His eyes, filled with a mixture of fear and desperation, met mine as he recounted this harrowing story. I was at a loss for words. Patrick wasn't one to make up fake stories, but how could such a story be true? Trying to offer some comfort, I said, man, it was probably just someone in a realistic costume trying to spook you. And if that was the aim, they definitely succeeded. Patrick's eyes stared into mine intensely, making it clear that his story was far from over. I tried telling myself it was just my imagination, you know, he said, a nightmare born from too many horror movies and sweets. He'd nearly managed to convince himself that the previous year's incident was a figment of his imagination. That is, until the following Halloween. Once again, he was home. Well, not entirely alone. He'd sneakily invited his girlfriend over. They had decided to spend the evening wrapped up in each other's company, setting out a bowl of candy on the porch for the kids, and drawing the curtains for some privacy. The familiar screams of horror movies punctuated their intimate moments, while the echoing laughter and footsteps of children coming and going for candy played in the background. As the evening went on, the trick-or-treaters began to dwindle. The significance of the time slipped their minds. As the clock ticked past 10 p.m., suddenly the unmistakable thud of a weighty presence on the porch pulled them from their reverie, followed by a forceful knock. Thinking it was perhaps just latecomers, or maybe they ran out of candy, Patrick approached the door. As he cautiously peered out, the chilling sight of a familiar yellow eye met his. Panic flooded him. When the haunting mantra began, trick or treat, give me something good to eat. In a sudden burst of adrenaline, Patrick pushed back against the door as the goat figure tried to force its way inside. The horrifying push of war ensued with the creature's hooves clawing at the threshold. Patrick's desperate screams for help roused his girlfriend, and together they struggled against the monstrous intruder. Finally, they managed to secure the deadbolt, but the persistent ramming from the other side threatened to unhinge the door altogether. Amidst the chaos and her own screams, Patrick's girlfriend recognized the danger they were in, even if she hadn't directly witnessed the horror outside. Turn off the lights, Patrick yelled, bracing himself against the door. The moment the switch was flicked, a stifling silence enveloped the room. They stayed hidden in the dark the weight of the unknown pressing down on them, not daring to confirm if the creature still lurked outside. Belief washed over them only when they discerned the familiar sound of gravel crunching under tires. The return of Patrick's parents signaled a break from the terror. Sitting across from me, Patrick's voice trailed off, his hollow gaze, and the weight in his words made it clear this wasn't just a one-time event. This creature, whatever it was, sought him out every year if there was even the slightest hint of light. It didn't matter where he was, it always found him. Laughing nervously, I clapped him on the back, expecting a punchline or a gotcha moment, but none came. To change the tense atmosphere, I handed him a drink, trying to escape the unsettling reality of his story. Halloween came and went, and soon, Halloween was upon us again. I'd immersed myself in preparations for a Halloween party at my place. Despite sending Patrick an invitation, he declined, unsurprisingly. The night was in full swing, a lively mix of laughter, music, and costumed revelers, when suddenly, a few minutes past the 10 o'clock mark, my phone's ringtone pierced the air. It was Patrick. Confusion mixed with concern. I answered. Instead of a greeting, I was met with the harrowing sounds of Patrick sobbing uncontrollably, intermixed with a violent pounding, so loud and aggressive that it seemed to shake my very soul. His frantic mumblings were barely comprehensible punctuated only by a desperate plea that I write something. Suddenly, a deafening crash echoed through the line, as if a barrier had been broken down. Patrick's terror-filled scream pierced the air, paralyzing me, but it was the next voice that truly chilled me to the core. It was an impossible sound, a dual-toned voice, both man and creature, speaking simultaneously. It wasn't an echo, but a chorus of two voices from one throat, one natural, and the other a deep, menacing growl. Then, as quickly as the chaos started, the background noises dwindled with Patrick's screams and the sinister jingling moving further away. 
until they vanished entirely. Without a second thought, I abandoned my party, rushing through the streets towards Patrick's condo. A cold unease settled in my stomach as I arrived to find his front door, or what remained of it, hanging off its hinges. There, on the welcome mat, lay Patrick's phone, the scene. Punctuated only by the soft glow of countless solar lights Patrick had embedded in his flower bed earlier in the year, 